calling a travel agent to book a holiday. First, you will have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Hello, Travel Wide, can I help you? Oh yes, good morning. I'm looking for a hotel for a long weekend. OK, first of all, um, where would you like to stay? I mean, are you looking for a peaceful weekend in the country, a busy city break or a relaxing time at the beach? Well, I certainly want a quiet weekend. I work very hard, so I'd like to relax for a few days. Right, so it would be country or beach. Which would you prefer? Mm, the beach is very relaxing, but I think I'd rather go to the country this time. OK, that's fine. Let me have a look at country hotels. Would you like to stay at a spa hotel where you could swim, read, eat healthy food and have relaxing treatments? Or would you prefer a family hotel on a farm? Uh, I must say I like the idea of a spa. Well, that's great. Now, let's just look at our spa hotels. Mm, you definitely don't want the beach. No, I'd like to go somewhere in the countryside, somewhere where I can go for walks. OK, then it won't be the Ocean Waves Resort. Farmhouse Getaways is a family-run hotel in the country, but it's not a spa. How does Sparkling Spring sound? It's a luxury spa hotel in the countryside, with an indoor heated pool and views over the fields and woods nearby. That sounds exactly what I'm looking for. Let's go for that. Excellent. Now, if I can take some details, I can make the booking for you. Could I have your full name, please? Yep. My name's William French. William French. And your address? Number four, The Willows, Stanmarch, Norfolk, NE1, 4SP. The Willows. Sorry, how do you spell that? W-I-L-L-O-W-S. The Willows. Thank you. And can I have a contact number for you? Yes, my mobile's probably the best one. It's 07632 112254. 07632 112250. No, it's 07632 112254. Sorry, 54. And when would you like to go? On the weekend of the 15th of June. Fine. Checking in on the 15th of June. And when would you like to check out? I'd like to stay until the night of Monday the 18th of June, so I'd be leaving on Tuesday the 19th. Right. Check out on Tuesday the 19th of June. And how will you be paying? By credit card. How much will it be? Ah, uh, let me see. Four nights at £90 per night is £360. Is that OK? It includes breakfast and dinner and a treatment a day. Yes, that sounds fine. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Would you like me to tell you how to get to the hotel once you're in the village? It's a bit difficult to find. Oh, yes, please. I have maps on my mobile phone, but there isn't always a signal. OK. Well, coming into the village from the motorway, which is in the east, the first building you see on your right is the church. It's right opposite the garden centre. OK. The church is on my right and the garden centre on my left. Yes. 
Just after that, you'll come to the railway crossing, and then you'll see the river on your left. After that on the right, you'll see the school. It's just before the bridge, over the river. So the school's before the bridge? Yes, that's right. Now, just after the bridge, you'll see a turning on your left. Take that and follow the road through the fields. On your left, between the road and the river, you'll see a lot of vegetable gardens. Just keep going down the road to the end. It leads straight into the car park at the spa. You can't miss it. It's at the end of the road. Thank you very much for your help. My pleasure. I hope you have a... Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear part of a lecture on art and culture in the Indonesian island of Bali. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Last week, we looked at the traditional art of Japan. In this week's lecture, we're going to move south and look at the very special way in which art has developed in the beautiful island of Bali, which is now part of Indonesia. I'll begin by giving you a brief historical overview. It's thought that the first inhabitants of Bali were farmers who arrived around 3000 BC, at the beginning of the Iron Age. They probably originally came from China, and in Bali they cultivated rice and built temples ornamented with wood and stone carvings and statues. The Hindu religion was introduced in the 14th century AD, and this has remained the main religion on the island. This was an important period in the artistic development of the island, when sculptors, poets, priests and painters worked together in the service of the ruling families. Rather than painting everyday scenes, artists concentrated on narrative paintings illustrating the epic stories of Hinduism. Bali's rich natural resources have always made it an alluring goal for merchants, and from the 17th century onwards, Dutch ships visited the island to trade in spices and luxury goods. Gradually, the old royal families lost their power, and eventually, in 1906, the Dutch East Indies Company was founded, and the island became a colony. In the 20th century, art then took on a very different role, as a tool accessible to everyone in the fight of the Balinese people against colonization, rather than as the property of a minority. Shortly after this, in the 1920s, stories of the beauty of the island of Bali began to spread around the world, and Balinese art underwent another vast transformation with the advent of tourism to the island. At first, this was only on a small scale, but it had important effects. Expatriate artists from Holland and Germany settled on the island, bringing paper, Chinese ink and other new materials with them. They worked with local artists, encouraging them to experiment with concepts like naturalism, expressionism, light and perspective, as well as to move away from the traditional focus on narrative painting towards something closer to their own experience. When independence came in 1945, this desire for an art to match a new national identity became stronger and the traditional narrative paintings started to give way to scenes showing the everyday life of the Balinese people, 
harvests, market scenes and daily tasks, as well as the myths and legends of their history. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Many of the features that give this art its special place in the world today can be traced back to these historical roots. One feature that is rooted in the events of the last century is that today in Bali the production and the appreciation of art is not restricted to a minority. In fact, there is a famous saying that in Bali everyone is an artist. And it's not considered that to make art or talk about art any formal training is needed. Art is just produced as part of Balinese life. Even fruit salad is served with flowers strewn on top. One factor which has contributed to this productivity is Bali's fertility. Over the centuries, the rich soil and the fact that food and shelter are readily available has given the islanders the leisure to develop their arts. While painting, sculpture, carving and music have traditionally been the province of men, women have channeled their creative energy into making lavish offerings to the gods with spectacular pyramids of flowers, fruit and cakes offered at the temples on festival days and celebrations. All these kinds of art still have close links with the religion of the people and are something that people do on a daily basis. Another special characteristic of art in Bali is that it is not generally seen as an individual pursuit. In the West, art is often carried out by the artist on his own, reflecting his own individual world view in the hope of achieving personal wealth and fame. For Balinese artists, art is something that's done as a group, and many artists may participate in one piece of work. And Balinese art is not restricted to temples and offerings. It decorates objects such as jackets, motorcycles, hotel menus, and so on. But perhaps the most significant characteristic of Balinese art, and one that distinguishes it most from the art of the West, is to do with its expected lifespan. Carvings are made in soft stone, which is gradually destroyed over the years. The humid climate rots paper and cloth paintings. The magnificent offerings of fruit and sweets are eaten. Wooden statues are destroyed by insects. But Balinese artists accept that their work is ephemeral, not permanent, and instead of slavishly preserving the originals, they produce new art. And all this rebuilding, renovating and replacing means that the island's art continually evolves and perpetuates itself. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will now listen to a talk on bicycles. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Today we're going to talk about the latest bikes for professionals and novices. There's something to suit everyone from price to function. 
The Atlantis is a touring frame. It's also perfect for commuting and trail riding, and anything short of super fast road riding. The tubes are stout to take touring loads and trail abuses. The tyre clearances are majestic, so you can fit tyres up to 2.35 inches. It's designed for cantilevers or V brakes. If you have to limit yourself to just one bike and you want to be able to ride just about anywhere, this is the bike to be on. It is our most popular model for just that reason, and there isn't an unhappy Atlantis owner in the land. The Rambui A, our all around road bike, is available either as a frame with fork and headset for $1,400 or as a complete bike for $2,300. Compared to the Atlantis, it is a lighter frame, not intended for loaded touring or rough trail riding. As a road bike, it has side pull brakes. The Quick Beam is our version of the single speed bike. We've done it a little better though. The crankset has a 42 34 combination, running an 18 tooth freewheel cog in the rear. And the rear hub is threaded opposite the drive side, so you can install a fixed cog of your own choice. In essence, you can have four speeds on the quick beam if you choose. The quick beam is available as a frame with fork and headset for $900, or as a complete bike for $1,300. This is a rugged, versatile bike that you can ride on the road as well as on rough trail. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. The Saluki is our roadish, light touring, randonneuring frame. It's designed for 650B wheels. If 650B means anything to you, you'll either love it or think it's marketing suicide. If you're new to 650B and a follower, you won't want it. If you're new and a rebel, you will. Now, I'll just talk a little about saddle comfort. The road bike, for the most part, has turned into a high-tech, uncomfortable machine, and the proof is all around us. Look through any bike magazine or catalogue, and you'll see the saddle up to six inches higher than the handlebars. It is impossible to be comfortable on such a bike. It forces you to lean forward, putting more weight on your groin, hands and arms. People ride these bikes with straight, locked-out arms and wake up with aching backs. They endure it, get used to it, or buy recumbents. When we custom design a bike for you, you'll be able to get a comfortable position. Your back will be between 45 and 50 degrees, and there will be a noticeable bend in the arms. And most importantly, your arms won't be supporting your body weight. You won't have to look up to look ahead because you won't be hunched over and low. That means our bikes are more accessible for riding on the flats, or even for short climbs. We consider this when we design and build your custom frame. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Now, I'll start by explaining what homeless means, and it means a little more than simply sleeping out in the street. 
The people you see in parks and gardens or bus stops and shop doorways are a small percentage of the people that we class as homeless. People are homeless if they are sleeping on the floor or on the sofa at a friend's house. They are homeless if they are sleeping in a hostel or shelter for homeless people. They are homeless if they are sleeping in a car or any other vehicle. We also class people as homeless if they are separated from family or other people that they would normally live with. People are homeless if they live in conditions that are so bad that their health is affected, and they are homeless if they are in danger of violence or physical abuse. That means, as I said before, that homelessness is a much bigger issue than a few people sleeping in bus stops or shop doorways. This is just what you see. So why do people become homeless? People do not choose to be homeless. They are not sleeping rough because they have chosen to leave a safe home or families who love them. They are homeless because there is no other option. People become homeless because they are poor, because they cannot afford to pay rent, or sometimes because they cannot afford to pay the mortgage on a house or apartment that they have bought. People become homeless because they lose their job or have never had a job. There are related problems that often result in a person becoming homeless. Many homeless people have a drug addiction. They are either homeless because they spend their money on drugs, or they have become addicted to drugs because they are homeless. A high percentage of homeless people have mental health problems and find it difficult to make the decisions about their lives that most people can make. A number of homeless people are ex-prisoners. When they are released from prison, it is very difficult to find a job and a place to live. Many people become homeless because the owner of their home, a landlord or landlady, evicts them. If people have lived in the same place for a long time and then suddenly lose it, they can find it impossible to afford the increased rent for a new home. Many people have to move out of the place they live because it is dangerous. A young person may have a violent father or a wife a violent husband. These people are too afraid to stay in their home, and they risk making themselves homeless. Finally. In many parts of the country, there is just not enough housing. Certainly, not enough housing that poor people can afford. The increase in the value of property has made life difficult for many people, not just homeless people. I'm sure many of you will understand that. So, how do we deal with a problem as big as this? It isn't easy. In this country, people with very poorly paid jobs or no jobs at all receive some kind of financial support. In some cases, all or part of their rent is paid by the government. This helps to stop people becoming homeless. But if you are already homeless, it doesn't help. Most towns, like this one, have shelters for people who are temporarily homeless, but they cannot stay at them permanently. They have to move on after a certain period of time. Some towns have food kitchens where homeless people can get a meal two or three times a week. The problem is that shelters and food kitchens don't really deal with the cause of the problem; they deal only with the effect. People can stay in a shelter for a while, but it will not help them to find a home of their own, and that is what they need, of course. Now. I'm going to go on in a moment to talk about some of the suggestions that have been made in terms of dealing with homelessness, ideas for dealing with the problem in a more permanent way. I'll also talk about some of the programs that are in place and are, in some cases, very successful in other parts of the world. Before that, does anyone have any questions about what I have said so far? That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.